We are back, and the season rolls along to week five. We have our first top ten matchup of the season, and the conference schedules are rolling, and we have a loaded weekend of college football ahead of us. Only two segments today. We're kicking off with our OG segment, Pick 6, in which we preview six of the biggest games of the upcoming weekend, and we wrap it up. A revamp Brandon's Gambling Corner. Brandon is going to drop some knowledge on you guys where to put the money this weekend. We got some tough questions for him. The same questions we know you guys are going to face later this weekend. We have a full show today, guys. So let's go ahead, kick this off. So as I said, man, week five, an outstanding slate of games. We're here with pick six. I already said we picked six of the biggest and best games of the season. Let's get straight to it, B-Dub. We're going to start off with a huge AAC conference game between the number 25 Memphis Tigers and the SMU Mustangs. The um, Memphis is a three-point favorite, Brandon. Who do you have in this matchup and why? I've got Memphis because they're going to do SMU kind of like they did last season, I believe. I, I mean – SMU hasn't really impressed me so far this season. I understand they're three and zero, but those three wins—I mean, out of the three, what was the most impressive to you, Zach? I mean, I, I couldn't. Uh, I mean, maybe last week against—I I, now I'm blanking on who, who even they played, but they put up like sixty points or something like that. Right, and so I mean, I don't know. This team hasn't looked nearly as impressive as they did last season, um, and so I don't. I don't really know if, if I can give them any credit for those three wins. I mean, I get it. A win's a win, whatever. I still think Memphis, even though we've only seen one outing out of them, uh, have been super, super impressive. I think uh, Brady White's the better quarterback out of him and Shane Michelle. Um, I, I mean, even if you were just want to look at their stats, I mean, Brady White has four touchdowns in one game. Shane Michelle has seven in three games. So, I, I don't know, man. It, it, this is just one of those things that I can kind of feel. I mean, total yards between the two teams, 502 for Memphis, 562 for SMU. I mean, once again, that's one game for Memphis, three games for SMU. I just I, – I this game might be close, but I don't think it's three and a half points close. I mean, whoever made that spread should just it, maybe get a new job. And, may, and actually, this year you can trust me when I say that because I'm 6-0 in my gambling picks. I don't know if anyone's been keeping count. I mean, for anyone who hasn't been – I'm, I mean, I'm kind of turning into a sharp. Now, nah, don't keep count. He's just getting lucky. He's he's talking to some people. He's he's rigging the system. He he's lying to you guys. Fixing games, um, <laughs> fixing games over here. But Brandon, I kind of I, I think we have a unique situation with this game. I mean, Brandon, Memphis hasn't played since the fifth of this month. Yeah, and like all their games have been canceled due to COVID. They've been postponed. I mean, are they going to be rusty? Are they going to be slow? Are they going to be in good shape? That's a huge storyline I'm going to be watching Saturday afternoon. And, yes, I mean, SMU has been doing great things since their struggle win. I, I think you would give it a struggle win, right? Yeah. Maybe. Uh, if that – because I think Texas State probably should have won that game. And yeah, we'll get to a we'll get to another team that uh, Texas State probably should have beat later in the show, but yeah, we're dubbing it a struggle win. But Brandon, two straight games over fifty points. They're averaging over six hundred total yards, only allowing about three eighty. Not great, but for an AAC defense, it's fine. The defense is starting to really help this explosive offense, which is going to be a big story. He says Shane Bouchelle. He's been pretty good these past few weeks i mean almost a thousand yards of the season but like you said he hasn't been as explosive down the field over the middle he in between the numbers he's been really good brandon 72 percent completion percentage there almost 500 yards four touchdowns and interception but he has to be able to push the ball down the field this weekend he has to be able to keep this defense off balance with his accuracy efficiency and his ability to create plays in the pocket and Brandon, my X factor for this game has to be Reggie Robertson. He's been Bouchelle's top target this season. He was tied with Jamar Chase last season in deep ball passing grade, according to Pro Football Focus. And that seems to be a missing this year, Brandon. Only one catch for over 20 yards this season, and it was that long touchdown in the third quarter against Texas State. And he's only got one other target at that level of the field. So you're telling me you have a guy who could stretch the field like Jamar Chase, but you're not getting him the ball? Yeah, that 
that, that that's a real problem. And if SMU expects to win this game, Robertson needs to stretch the field, challenge the secondary of this Tigers team, and Brady White. I expect nothing but greatness from him, Brandon. I think you agree with me there. Um, the only thing I have question marks about is can that chemistry be carried over for almost a month? This team lost pieces like Kenny Gainwell and some other, you know, Antonio Gibson, some other offensive weapons. Last season, he had 350 yards and three touchdowns against SMU. I need to see it again, Brandon. SMU's going to come ready. They're going to look for revenge and a close loss from last season. He's got to take care of the ball. He's got to make good decisions, and he's got to take this offense to its full potential, which I don't think he did that in the Arkansas State game per se. But they also have to continue that run game. Brandon, Kenny Gainwell, if, if this team had Kenny Gainwell, I don't think they lose a game this year, to be completely honest with you. But okay. Kenny Gainwell's that good. He's out. Rodriguez Clark, he did, he did a great job. Over five yards per carry, over 100 yards. Brandon, if Memphis doesn't rush for 150 to 200 yards, I think SMU wins this game. I don't. I think if Memphis can't move the chains, keep that SMU offense on the sidelines, it's going to get ugly. And I think it's going to be closer than something because Memphis is going to be rusty. But, Brandon, I agree with you. Three points, three and a half points is a lot. I'm going to go with just half a point above it. I think Memphis has too many athletes. I think Memphis escapes this weekend with a 52-48 to 48 win over whoa, SMU. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Easy, killer. That is, I mean, points. I mean, Let's talk about points for a second. Well, last year, what it was fifth, what fifty six to forty nine or something like that. I mean, it was a high enough. scoring I mean, game. Like I said, I mean, the more, like I've always said, I mean, the more points, the better, in my opinion. So I'm not mad at it. It's just wow. I mean, that's just a lot. That's that, that's over one hundred if we're doing over under. So that seventy four and a half they have the line set at right now can just that can that can turn around and leave uh, if if your prediction's anywhere near right. Yeah I, yeah, I think they hit. I, I, they could have set the over at two hundred. I'm taking the over every time with this team. Yeah, that's bananas. Uh, so I'm going to go with Memphis as well. Um, I, I do think these teams are very capable of scoring points. You know, I'm not going to forget that Memphis only put up 37 against Arkansas State. So I don't think they put up that much against SMU. I'm going to go with Memphis. Ah, they might. I'm going to go with Memphis 41, SMU 35. I like it. I like it. But we're going to move on here, guys. We're getting to Brandon's favorite team in the country. Uh, we got we got TCU at Texas at number nine Texas this weekend. Brandon, the, the spread is twelve and a half for the Longhorns. Brandon, is the Big Twelve chaos going to continue this weekend? I certainly hope so because I really, really, really want Texas to lose, and I haven't sold myself on picking uh, picking against Texas quite yet. So let me. Let me talk myself into that hole during this segment, I guess. Uh, we all saw Texas last weekend go up against Texas Tech. You know, 63-56 to in an overtime win against Texas Tech. Yeah, it doesn't, that doesn't really win you a whole lot of uh, respect or street cred in the Big 12, or at least it shouldn't. Um, and it really wouldn't in a week that Oklahoma could actually pull off a win against Kansas State, but apparently that also can't happen. Uh, last weekend, we also saw... TCU just fall barely short to Iowa State in a 37-34 loss. But but TCU, I mean, Zach, they surprised me. I don't know about you. I mean, I just didn't even see them competing in this game. And they came out swinging, and, and they almost won this game. Yeah, I, I thought they should have won, in my opinion. I, I mean, if we're really looking at it, I thought they were the better team. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, maybe not the better team. But I don't I don't think they I think they shot themselves in the foot more so than Iowa State won that game. Um, I I mean, a three point win, I mean, a three a three point, you know, loss to Iowa State isn't something to hang your head about. I mean, it, especially with this Horn Frogs team. But for me, Brandon, the X factor for me is Zachary Evans is finally eligible for the Horn Frogs. Uh, he missed last week due to covid tracing. And Brandon, that's why they lost the game last week. That run game was not there for TCU. And if you can conv- combine Zachary Evans with um, Amari, I, I believe it's uh, Demersicado. Yeah. It's a one two punch there that's going to really disrupt this Texas defense, who I don't think is very good against runs. So listen, don't let the stats fool you. I know if you go look right now, Texas is only allowing about 79 yards per game rushing. That's not. That's not the case here. Uh, UTEP overmatched. Let's not 
put any stock into UTEP running on, you know, Texas. But I don't even think Texas Tech knows you could run the ball. Uh, I, I think I think they throw it every single play. So that 79 yards per game is not – I, I don't think that's the true potential of this Texas defense. Um, and, Brandon, I, I, do you really trust Sam Ellinger to continue to carry this Longhorns team down the stretch? I mean, he's been really good. Um, but, Brandon, he struggles against TCU. Last year he threw four interceptions, which led to a 10-point loss to the Horn Frogs. Yeah. No, it, it, it's not pretty. I mean, but if there was a season that I think that he could carry his team a little bit further, it is this season. I mean, we, I understand he's played, he's played uh, UTEP and he's played Texas Tech. But, I mean, it's nearly 700 yards passing, 10 touchdowns through two games. I mean, that's just impressive. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's really good, but all the pressure is on him, man. He's got to overcome past demons. Every year they lose to some teams they shouldn't. And, Brandon, the way the Big 12 is turning out this year, this could eliminate the Big 12 from the playoff race if Texas loses this game. Yeah. It, it absolutely could put the Big 12 in real jeopardy here. But, Brandon, last week already said TCU blew their chances with untimely mistakes. I think I, I trust Gary Patterson to have his team ready to play every weekend. I, I think Gary Patterson is a really good coach. Is he on the hot seat? P- probably. They haven't been as good recently. But two costly turnovers, no run game, really hurt them. Max Duggan was not healthy last week. He's more healthy now this week. He still completed, Brennan, 84% of his passes and, th- and threw for three touchdowns against a pretty good Iowa State defense. And – I don't think this Texas secondary offers the same challenge, which should only further boost his confidence. Plus, like I said, the return of Zachary Evans should really help. Brandon, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and make my pick here. I always put you on the spot first. TCU has had Texas's number in recent years. Brandon, uh, the Horn Frogs have beaten the Longhorns five out of the last six games they've played, and since joining the Big Twelve, TCU is six and two, and three and one in Austin. And this game doesn't have the same home field advantage that Texas is used to having. Um, I think Gary Patterson has the Longhorns number. They always seem to offer up a scheme that bothers Sam Ellinger. I think it's going to be the same this year. Trevon Mohig, uh, Mohig is still on that back end of the defense. I think he's going to have an interception or two. I think the Horn Frogs pull off the upset in Austin. Ooh. I have TCU beating Texas 37 to 31. Saturday afternoon down in Austin, Texas. Oh man, I don't know about that. Uh, as as much as you try to talk me into picking TCU right there, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to fall for your tricks, Zach. Um, and, and, <laughs> and and really, more than anything, I'm just I'm just hedging uh, my dismay on Saturday right now by by choosing Texas because if they win, now I'm happy because my pick won. And if they lose, I, I still win because Horn's down. So I'm going with Texas over TCU. I don't think that they cover the spread. Um, I'm going to go with Texas 31, uh, TCU 21. Ooh, 10 points. That's still a that's still a mean margin. But, guys, we're going to go to their arch rival. Uh, number 18, Oklahoma, travels to Iowa State. They're a seven and a half point favorite, Brandon. This game, I think, is going to be one of the best of the weekend. I mean, both of these teams are desperate for a win. The Sooners blew a 21 point lead last week to K State at home. And Iowa State finally got a close win over TCU last week after getting ravaged by the Raging Cajuns in week one. So, Brandon, who do you have in this matchup and why? Oh man, you I can't get my pick this early, Zach. Let me let me talk about this one for a second. Um, <laughs> so so obviously Spencer Radler looked rattled last weekend. We all saw it. I like it. I like it. A punny, but I like it. Uh, well, you get it. You understand. Um last weekend against Kansas State, obviously he came out looking strong and kind of just dipped off. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was like they felt comfortable in that lead and then they lost it. Or if there's some kind of mental block and they just can't beat Kansas State. You know, last year we chalked it up to them playing in Manhattan. And that field, I will say, beautiful field. It looks intimidating. I've never been. I might have to visit at some point. Uh, I still never went to go visit Zach at school. So that might have to happen sometime soon, maybe after coronavirus. But um, obviously it wasn't the the home field advantage for Kansas uh, State. 
it, it was just something. I don't know what it was. It was. It, it must have been magic, really. Um, so obviously, last week they didn't look very strong, and Iowa State hasn't really looked strong at all this season. I, I get it, UL. I wish I was a UL fan. I pretend to be on on Twitter. Um, go raging Cajuns. Uh, but I, I, don't, I still don't think they're like a great team. I mean, they've been pulling off wins, but other than this Iowa State win, which was a fourth quarter comeback, um, all of their other games have been really, really close. And not only really close, but they've all been comeback wins, like in the second half. And, and, and so I don't think that I don't think that a loss against UL really bodes super well for Iowa State. Um, I don't think a uh, a very small margin of victory against TCU bodes very well for Iowa State. Um, all of this said, I think Oklahoma is going to bounce back this week. I think that it, it I think that if you don't believe Lincoln Riley tore this team, I mean a whole new one in this locker room after this game and all during this week for losing to Kansas State for a second year in a row, you're maybe the most wrong human being I've ever met in my life. Um, so I think Oklahoma State is looking to bounce back. I think they're pissed off, and I think they're going to ravage uh, the Iowa State Cyclones this weekend. Ravage? Oh, yeah, I do. Big words, big words on the Blue Bloods. But Brandon Spitzer rather makes his first road start this weekend, though. That's a big yeah. thing. True, uh, and it's and it's worrisome after his performance last week. Last week, like you said, three interceptions against a K State secondary that was missing two starters. Right. Um, you know. Iowa State has a much better secondary, Brandon. They were 30th in the country coming into the season. Greg's, uh, Greg Osworth II, Lawrence White could really make Rattler Saturday night a living hell if he doesn't come ready to play. And the biggest thing is, is his confidence going to be in the right spot? He's still young. Yes, he's not a true freshman, but he's pretty much still, what, a redshirt freshman? Like, let's ease, let's ease up. But, right. you know, uh, you know, if if not, if if his confidence isn't there, I think this could be a long night. If he lives up to his potential, the Sooners are going to be fine. But the question marks for me, Brandon, real quick, are really growing for Rattler. Outside of that Missouri State game, I haven't seen anything that makes me think he's the he's the quarterback of the future for the Sooners. Right. I, I'm not on the hype train um, with everybody, but on the other side. Brock Purdy hasn't been great either. He's been underwhelming. I mean, last week he did have 78% completion percentage over 200 yards and a touchdown, but that's a major improvement from his 23.6 QBR against the Raging Cages in week one. But I need to see Purdy put together like a, a performance like he did consistently last year when he was top five, probably in the nation at some points of the year. I mean, he was rolling mid-year last year. And if Purdy shows up, the Cyclones can absolutely steal this game. And Brandon, my matchup to watch here, Barisi Hall, the running back for Iowa State against this Oklahoma defense. We saw Oklahoma absolutely struggle to contain a 5-5 deuce fawn last week. And no disrespect to Vaughn, but Hall is another caliber of running back. Um, you know, he's he racked up over 100 yards the first two weeks of the season against pretty good defenses. I mean, he scored four touchdowns on the ground. If Oklahoma cannot contain Barisi, then this game could be really ugly for the Sooners. And if they step up, Iowa State could be in trouble. Brandon, I always got to bring some facts, you know, history to this podcast um, Oklahoma lost their first September game since 2017 last week. And the Sooners have not lost back-to-back games in program history since 1999. Um, you have to go back even longer since they started 0-2 in the Big 12. Um, you know, this is, you know, I, I can't believe I'm going to say this, Brandon. All good things come to an end, and the Cyclones are going to complete the Red River robbery nah. sweep this weekend. Iowa State for the upset, tw- 42 to 38 over the Oklahoma Sooners. Brock Purdy gets 30. it done. Yep, Brock Purdy gets it done. Barisi Hall runs through this defense. I think Spencer Rattler makes mistakes at the wrong time. I think Iowa State jumps on Oklahoma this weekend, and I think. Next week, that Texas Oklahoma showdown um, in the Cotton Bowl. I think both teams are going to be caught looking ahead to that rivalry game next week. Yeah, I don't know. I, I I'll, I'll, I'll keep this short, but I, I obviously I already said I think that Oklahoma State ravages uh, Iowa State. 
Um, I'm going to go. I'm, I also think that that the uh, winner is going to score in the 40s. I'll go with 42. 28 Oklahoma. I think this offense is just too good against a really, really bad defense. Uh, I know you talked about how they came into the season 30th in in secondary performance. They, they've allowed uh, 277 pass yards on average through two games. So I, I just don't see it happening. I don't know, man. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, but yeah, two upsets for me in the Big 12. Brandon, you know, going with the wash. He, you know, you know how Brandon is. But that's right. We're going. We're going with uh, another team that one of us is really high on, another one's not. We got the number 12 North Carolina Tar Heels traveling to Boston College. UNC is a 13-and-a-half-point favorite. Brandon, I, I, don't, I don't know what to tell you. I think I think this might get out of hand. It probably will get out of hand. Um, I, I don't like to give you a whole lot, Zach, but I'll give you this. I think that North Carolina is the better team in this matchup by leaps and bounds. Uh, there's a reason the spreads at at 14 points. There's a reason that that Boston College's money lines at plus 400. I I don't know. I, th- I think it's a super super long shot um, for Boston College here. I get it. You know, last the past two weekends they've won their games. They've won against a Duke team that obviously must be really bad if they got beat 26 to six by Boston College because Boston College last weekend went out and just barely edged out a game against Texas State. Um, so I'm not, I'm not very confident. <laughs> hey, Tex- Texas Texas State's been rolling, man. They keep getting within, what, three, th- seven to three points of these D1 teams, and they are coming. Well, I, I mean, mean, you say that, but they've, they've, <laughs> they've played four games, I guess. Um, but, but not really. I mean, they, they, they won against ULM the week, uh, they, the week before Boston College. Uh, they beat them by a lot. Cause ULM just sucks. Uh, they beat uh, Texas San Antonio by three points, and then they lost to SMU by a touchdown. So, like, nothing has really impressed me from Texas State. <laughs> I mean, but we have another situation like Memphis here. I mean, the Tar Heels have not played since their Week 2 win over Syracuse on the 12th. Yeah. And I, I don't know, but, I mean, I think this matchup is just terrible for Boston College, Brandon. I mean, this this defense might be the worst in the ACC. Yeah. They're allowing over 350 yards per game, 130 yards rushing, 220 passing. And you have Sam Howell, Daz Newsom, Michael Carter, and Javante Williams coming into town. This is going to be uh, – well, this could be a beatdown, an absolute forget, beat down. People forget Sam Howell has more interceptions than touchdowns this season. So maybe maybe it won't be a problem. Hey, maybe maybe not. But, I mean, this is the same offense even with those turnovers that put up five over 500, almost 500 yards on a Syracuse defense, which is much better than this Boston College defense. Um and I think Boston College has to play almost perfect game to get out with a win in this one. And, you know, there is an X factor here uh, here with, uh, you know, the quarterback for Boston College, Phil Jerkovich. I mean, he has experience and talent, but Brandon, he's been inconsistent this season. Yeah, he has 500 yards, about 500 yards passing, but three interceptions to two touchdowns is not great. And, or, and or t- three touchdowns to two interceptions, but he graded out at a 58 by pro football focus against Texas State. Yeah, that one. is that is horrible. I mean, 200 yards, a touchdown interception is not going to cut it against this North Carolina defense. And, Brandon, his ability to throw the ball down the field is god-awful. I mean, if he can't protect the ball, those extra possessions, if you give Sam Howell and that offense extra possessions, it's a wrap. Throwing 20-plus yards downfield, Brandon, Jerkovich is 22%, has a 22% completion percentage, only 97 yards, a touchdown, and two interceptions. That's wild. And with the linebackers and slot corners for the Tar Heels are too good. They're going to take away those underneath routes from this Boston College offense, I believe. And he's going to have to force stuff downfield, and I think that's where the Tar Heels eat. I think Howell in this team does show a little bit of rust, Brandon. But I think that talent is going to be too much for the for you know for this Boston College team. I th- I think turnovers and explosion by the Tar Heels is going to be the storyline of the game. I, th- I have North Carolina winning forty one to seventeen up there in Boston College this weekend. I mean, what a margin sack! Um, I'm going to go with North Carolina thirty five, uh, Boston College 
uh, I don't want to say 17, but I almost did uh, 14. Hey, fair enough, fair enough. But guys, we're going to end off this segment with two huge ranked SEC matchups. One's probably going to be a little bit more competitive than the other. Um, you know, we have the number 13 Texas A&M Aggies going to Bryant-Denny to take on the number two ranked Alabama Crimson Tide. Alabama is a 17 and a half point favorite, Brandon. And I don't think, I don't think I'm going to surprise anyone by saying this. I don't even know if this game's going to be competitive. It won't be. It won't be even a little bit. Um, this is simply not Texas A&M's year like they thought it might be. And they got, I mean, I'll, I'll say it, they got screwed by, by, changing their schedule up to where they have a week two visit to Tuscaloosa. Um, is I assume Alabama's letting fans in their stadium. Uh, uh, I think it's 25%. I think it's 20 or 25%. Right. LSU's at 25%. Which, which, is, the, which is the normal for Alabama games, but yeah, we can keep going. <laughs> well, yeah. As long as, I keep, uh, as long as I keep booking them for 2.30 in the afternoon, then it'll stay that way. Actually, you know, there's been a little bit of a cool front in the South, so maybe maybe there'll be some fans out there. Um, anyway, uh, look, I'll, I'll say it for, for all my non-gambling fans, uh, Alabama is on the money line minus 1100, which means you have to bet $1,100 to win $100 in this game. Not great. Texas A&M's plus 700, which means you bet 100, you win 700. So that's how not confident the bookmakers are. That's how not confident everyone who's betting on this game is in Texas A&M. And really, if I were making this book, I'd make it even steeper than that. I'd give Texas A&M like plus 850. I, I think it's awful. I think their odds are awful to win this game. I think Kellen Mond, Zach, I'm going to say it. He's a fraud. Uh, he's a lie. He's not, Oh, he, man. He is. He's a fraud. I mean, last week against Vanderbilt, he, this man had 189 yards passing, Zach. One touchdown. In this hey, don't, entire don't, forget, game. Th- don't forget about his three fumbles. Yeah. So, yeah, he looks real good, guys. Um, I don't know. Mac Jones is coming out looking strong so far this season. I get it. Alabama only played Missouri, but I mean, 250 yards pass and two touchdowns. I'll take that. If you can give that to me and, every and week, two I'll quarters take it. and two yeah. quarters, you give that to me, you give that to me in one half. I'll take it every single week. Um, I'll, I'll, I will give Texas A&M this. I, I, I think, I think that they're running that thing. The run game is, uh, pretty solid and it was pretty solid against Vanderbilt I'm not sure how well that's going to bode against Alabama who has just I mean Zach how much better is this Alabama defense than a Vanderbilt defense I I don't even know if that's comparable I mean how much how much better is Lamar Jackson than me at football that's that's about the comparison (laughs) we're gonna have to make it's like if you put me uh behind center and then you put Patrick Mahomes behind center on another field like which game are you gonna watch i'm gonna watch the patrick mahomes game i'm leaving my own game to go watch that one that's a much better exactly game. So, exactly so yeah i mean i will give it to him he had a great game 117 yards rushing is that but Najee harris i mean just because he only played two quarters racked up nearly 100 yards and three touchdowns doesn't mean that he's not the better running back. Like I like I've been saying for weeks, Najee Harris probably the best running back in college football, maybe the best player in college football this season. Uh, this, I mean, I, I said that Oklahoma was going to ravage Iowa State. Alabama is going to rag. I mean, they were going to kill Texas A&M this weekend. A thousand percent. You can't you can't get a struggle win over Vandy at home and expect to travel to Bryant Denny and pick up a win over Alabama. I mean, no. This this Texas A&M secondary has a horrendous matchup against a three-headed monster that's Alabama's receiving core. Uh, you know, Jalen Waddle, 130-yard performance and two touchdowns last weekend. He looks even better than Jerry Judy did last year in this offense. He looks like a better fit. He looks more explosive. This kid's legit. Devontae Smith is back. D- didn't play much. Still had 89 yards. And he's going to be a problem for the secondary. I don't think the speed of these guys is, can be matched anywhere on the field by Texas A&M. And then John Mechie the third, He's stepping up. He looks like he's going to be the Henry Ruggs replacement in this offense. A&M does not have a defender in that secondary that can hang with any of these guys. You can't cover them all. Pray for these DBs because it is going to be a massacre Saturday afternoon in Bryant Denny. And then let's get to the man of the hour that Brandon already brought up, Kellen Mond. 
three fumbles bailed out by Isaiah Spiller, his running back, who had 117 yards, but 59 of those came on one run. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, this Bama defense held Missouri to 69 yards rushing, didn't allow a touchdown until late in the third. Um, you know, this game may, you know, look great on paper 13 versus two. What a top, a top 15 matchup. This is more like if Clemson had to play Texas State, it's going to be that bad. I don't think Amon's going to have to find a way to make plays outside the pocket. I think Bama's going to get to him a lot in the pocket, look for a lot of sacks, look for a lot of forced mistakes, thrown away balls by Kellen Mond. I think this front seven is probably arguably the best in the SEC. I mean, the, that defensive line looked unbelievable last week. And you got Dylan Moses at linebacker. Um, and it's, like you said, Najee Harris, the X factor for me. Uh, you know, Brandon, as good as Mac Jones, as good as Jalen Waddle, Devontae Smith, all those guys are, if Najee Harris gets rolling, this offense looks unstoppable because you can't stop both. There's there's just no way. You either have to drop a defender in the box to stop Harris, but then guess what? You got one on one coverage outside with Jalen Waddle, Devontae Smith, and you're getting roasted. And if and if you don't stack the box, Najee Harris is gonna run for 150 yards on you. He's gonna run for three touchdowns and run over your middle linebacker because he's bigger than him. He's like the kid that picks on everybody at the playground. It's ridiculous. And you know, I think Najee Harris's success means more to Mac Jones than anything. Mac Jones is at his best. When defender when defenses are focusing on Najee Harris and you know I, I think this is going to be bad, Brandon. I, I think he, I, you know Vandy racked up over a hundred yards rushing last week on Texas A and M. Alabama might rush for two fifty and, and it won't even be close. And they might throw for three hundred. I think Alabama's in another tier when compared to Texas A and M. I think CBS is going to be wishing they picked the Auburn Georgia game as to air or even the LSU Vandy game. I think that might even be a better game than this one. Um, I don't, th- I don't, th- I think this one's going to be over by the end of the first quarter, Brandon. I have AM pulling it a little bit closer late, but I have Alabama 49, Texas AM 20. Okay. I'm going to go with Alabama uh, 38, Texas AM 10. I like that. I, you know, I'm I'm for that because Alabama's pretty good about pulling their starters, so they don't like to they don't usually run up the score that much. But to the matchup for the weekend, and I'm not just saying that because my Auburn Tigers are playing in it. I mean, once you have a four versus seven matchup a week two, that's pretty big. Um, you know, Auburn, the number seven Auburn Tigers traveling to Athens, Georgia, to face the number four Georgia Bulldogs. Georgia is a six and a half point favorite. That line moved down from seven. Brandon. Um, you know, what's your take on this game? This is this is going to be a big one. The Deep South's oldest rivalry is back for the first time. This is the earliest it's been played, Brandon, since the first ever meeting back in like 1860 something when it when they played it in February because you know college football wasn't really an organized thing back in the 1800s. They were just playing uh, whenever they felt like it, whenever it matched, whenever it wasn't like harvest season. They were they were playing exactly. football. Well. Well, it was funny because Auburn and Georgia played in February. Auburn's next game wasn't until like October second that year, so they had like a they had like a had like a seven month break. No, no wonder it took so long for them to discover the uh, the forward pass. But anyway, I, I don't know, man. This is tough because in my eyes, I mean, after after rewatching this Georgia um, Arkansas game from this last week. I am not convinced that anybody on Georgia's offense is capable of even holding a football. And so I don't, how they're a six and a half point favorite, I guess I'll never really understand. Um, Auburn looked really good last weekend, too. I mean, that's, it's not, it's not like both of them struggled in their matchups. Auburn played a ranked, a ranked team and they performed much better than Georgia did against Arkansas. I understand the final score, 37-10. Looks like Georgia won this one pretty easily. But, I mean, anyone who watched this game realizes that this Georgia offense is bad, and they are going to remain bad until Stetson Bennett just isn't the starter anymore. But, Zach, you you told me a little bit – you told me a few things. Uh, You told me something about the quarterback room at Georgia that, I mean, I'll give you you the pleasure of announcing here. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I mean, okay, so I, I, one, I want to correct you. Don't leave Stetson Bennett alone. He played really well last week. 
Okay. He wasn't the problem. It was Dewan Mathis. Okay. Dewan Mathis is buff. I mean, Bennett had over 200 yards passing, two touchdowns, was good on the ground. Mathis, on the other hand, had a 47% completion percentage for 55 yards and an interception yeah, in the first good. half. <laughs> Horrible. But, yeah, so the biggest storyline, like Brandon said, which quarterback is going to be taking the QB1 stats for the Bulldogs? JT Daniels was cleared as a Monday. Brandon, I have been scouring the web. I've been on Georgia um, 247 recruiting Bad. boards, all that kind of a, stuff. That is a dangerous part of the internet, oh, my friend. Oh, listen. I, I, how about at the end of this segment, I'll give you all some takes that I've seen from Georgia fans. Like Bo Nix is going to throw six interceptions this weekend. But oh, let's just, we'll get to that in just a little bit. But um, JT Daniels is clear, guys. But according to Rusty uh, Mancella 27 Sports, who um, we – we kind of talked about him earlier. He was the one that broke the news that JT Daniels was going to be declared eligible eventually to play this year. Um, he's very, very accurate with his sources um, and everything. JT Daniels has not taken a single first team rep yet, Brandon, including this week. That's, um, that's real tough. Dewan Mathis has gotten the most first team reps, according to him, while Stinson uh, Bennett has gotten a handful. So it's really anybody's guess right now, Brandon, who's who's going to take the field first for the Bulldogs. But according to all reports, it is more likely that all three see the field than just one sees the field. That's right. that's the that's the report coming out of Athens right now. And it could be Kirby Smart trying to play hard to read. It could be the chess match because we've already seen the chess match in the press conference. Uh, Gus Malzahn called Georgia the most talented team that Auburn's going to play this year. And. Kirby Smart called him out and was like, well, that's his coach speak. He was like, if we want to be fair, Auburn's the most talented team we're going to play. And then he said, the team we're going to play next week is the most talented team we're going to play. And then um, one of the Auburn beat reporters posted a 247 composite that showed that Georgia had the most recruiting talent in the entire country on their team right now in terms of five stars and four stars. So technically, Georgia is the most talented team in the country according to recruiting rankings right now. But that's a whole other thing. But Brandon... I have questions with all three of these quarterbacks, just like you do. Um, my question for Mathis is, does he have the it factor to lead this offense? You said you rewatched the game. You saw how just out of sorts that offense was with Mathis in the game. He looked overwhelmed. He looked like he bailed on the pocket. He had no accuracy. He, he, he took unnecessary hits. And if Arkansas is forcing him into this, this Auburn defense is going to have a field day with Dewan Mathis if he comes out and plays like that. Yeah, I agree. And – you know, with Bennett, Brandon, it's he's a former walk on. Is he really that good, or was it just Arkansas? I have full Arkansas. confidence. Like I know you're my co-host, you're like one of my best friends, and everything. I have full confidence you could throw for 200 yards on Arkansas. I have full. I would bet my entire salary that you got 200 yards on that Arkansas defense. That's but really nice. Brandy, everyone knows on this podcast, JT Daniels, we are sold on him. You don't have to do anything with us. But the thing is, if he's not been practicing really. Is he 100% healthy and how much rust? I mean, Brandon, I don't care how good you are. You could take Patrick Mahomes and sit him out for over a year and not let him practice. I don't know if I would trust him just to throw him right into a game. And Daniels isn't on that level. How are you going to throw Daniels into arguably the game of the year so far and just in primetime game day against a top seven team and be like, hey, I hope you're ready? Yeah. What an intro to the SEC, right? Yeah, I mean, for sure. I, I mean, God, man, that's – I mean, and Brandon, is there any chemistry with any of the first-team wide receivers? Is him Have him and George Pickens done any live scrimmage, you know, playing together? I don't know I exactly, mean, but that, 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 that seems like a weak argument to me. I feel like you put those two on the field, like magic might happen. That, that's true. Yeah, I mean, magic may happen, but – I don't think this Auburn defense is a scrub defense whatsoever. And I, I mean, that secondary forced turnovers last week with Terry Wilson. And Brandon, my biggest question is all three of these quarterbacks, even JT Daniels. Yes, he has a year of experience. Did USC play a single primetime, big time game? No. Really? Not this no. level. So no. <laughs> are any are any of these quarterbacks ready for this moment? Prime time, college game day, second biggest robbery for the program. And some fans would argue the biggest, even over Florida. And you're going to have to go there home, the, se- the season home opener. The stadium's not going to be rocking like it usually is. And you're going to have an Auburn team who's pissed off that they lost by one play last year. 
Right. Uh, it's going to be bad, Brandon, but I, I, I'm really worried about this quarterback situation. On the other side, I mean, I got questions about Bo Nix, too. Don't think I'm just an Auburn homer here. Bo Nix comes in after call. He was the reason the Auburn Tigers lost this game last year, and Jordan Hare missed a fourth and two pass. The dude's wide open for a touchdown, hits him in the back of the head on just a yeah, drop down yeah. pass. I mean, it was horrible. I could have made that pass with my foot. <laughs> and it, it, it was it's bad. And Brandon, the thing is, is is he going to have the road woes that he had last year, or is he finally grown up and is he ready for the moment? I mean, Brandon, the only two games last season where Bo Nix graded sixty or above by Pro Football Focus last season were Arkansas and Texas A and M. That's crazy. And those were the two road wins Auburn had last year. He graded under it for Minnesota in the bowl game, under it for LSU, obviously, definitely under it for Florida. I mean, he struggled on the road last year. And he showed promise last weekend, but again, that's in the confinements. Jordan Harry, three touchdowns, no turnovers. Knicks cannot turn the ball over this weekend. If Knicks has a single uh, – okay, maybe a single one's going to be okay, but if he has anything more than a single interception – it's over for the Auburn Tigers. They're losing this game. He's got to keep the ball with the Auburn Tigers. They have to be able to move the chains, control the top possession in this game. And he's going to have to be accurate. He's going to have to be confident. We saw his confidence just wither away when he was on the road. And I need to see that. I need to see something different. I mean, there's no more saying, Oh, he's just a true freshman. No, you are, you have played. This is your time to shine. There is no more excuses for Bo Nix. And, Brandon, do you, uh, here's what the game's going to come down to. I have two matchups. I think you probably will agree with me on at least the first one. Whichever team can establish their running game is going to win this game. I talked all about this quarterbacks, but it comes down to who can run the ball. Because last week, both teams, neither team topped 120 yards, and both teams averaged under three yards per carry, Brandon. Right. That's, that's god-awful. That is against Arkansas, Kentucky. You couldn't get me three yards per carry. Bo Nix led Auburn in rushing with 35 yards. Right. And Not great. I, do you trust any quarterback, Brandon, right now based on experience, training, injuries, to carry either of these teams in this game? Um, if No, not currently, no. If JT Daniels was healthy and healthy and yeah. would be would have been practicing this entire offseason, then absolutely, but he hasn't. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think whoever fails to establish a run game is going to lose. Um, Sean Shivers, Tank Bigsby, DJ Williams are Auburn's top options. There's not a clear number one there with Auburn. <clears throat> Zamir White for the Bulldogs, obvious number one option. Number one running back in the country a few years back. He's going to have to step up. He had 70 yards, but most of it came in the second half against Arkansas. If you're a five-star running back against uh, behind Georgia's offensive line, I need you to put up 100 yards against um, Arkansas. That's right. ridiculous. And I promise you Sunday night, guys, when we're recording, you know, our recap episode, we're going to be talking about this, uh, this, the run game, the rushing yard difference, time of possession being the difference between who won and who lost this game. And I think there's no better coordinator battle in the country right now. I guess in a game that I've seen because you have Kevin Steele versus Todd Munkin. Um, and you have Kirby Smart versus Chad Morris. It's going to be so interesting to watch because they're all great coordinators. Kirby Smart has always had Gus Malzahn's number from his time at Alabama, from his time at Georgia. Georgia has always – the only game they didn't have Malzahn's number was 2017 when Rhett Lashley – when uh, not Rhett Lashley. My bad. I feel like an, an a-hole on that one. Way to but, go. <laughs> yeah. Um, can, can Dillingham calling the plays on that one, but listen, Morris's offense brings a whole new dynamic. That should be interesting to watch, but Brandon, Kevin Steele's the only defensive coordinator who had any chance of shutting LSU down last year. Right. And, I, but my thing is how do you fully prepare for three potential quarterbacks who all bring something completely different? And how do you even prepare for someone like JT Daniels? who you haven't even seen play in over a year. Right. I mean, I don't know how you do. Yeah, and Munkin, it, I think Georgia knows who's who they're rolling off with. It's offensive coordinator. You can't game plan around like question marks with your quarterback. You got to have to know who's playing. I think they know. And Brandon, if I had to put money on it, I think Bennett takes the first snap, and I think Daniels, if he struggles, will come in and play. I really do. I don't think they're going to put Matheson. They they saw what happened. If they put Matheson 
Auburn will be up, it, depending on how long they put them in, by the end of the first quarter, Auburn will be up 14 nothing if Dewan Mathis goes in. I think is he's that bad. I think yeah. Auburn forces turnovers and they're gonna they're gonna run up the score on Georgia if they keep Mathis in. Yeah. No, I agree. And Brandon for picks, um I'm betting on Kev- Kevin Steele here over Todd Munkin. Uh, and for quarterback, Brandon, I'm going with, you know, the healthiest and right now the most experienced quarterback on the field in Bo Nix. And I think the Tigers do pull up the upset. They'll be the first win in Athens since 2005. It's a close one. I think Auburn scores a late touchdown to win. I think Georgia has to lead late. I have Auburn 27, Georgia 23. Yeah, I, I also agree. It's going to be a really close game. Um, man, just based off of Georgia's offense alone. I think I'm going to go with Auburn in this one. Um, and Zach, you better oh. go ahead and start praying right now. Oh, no. if, change your pick. If Bo Nix has your one interception, I'm not picking Georgia. Why would I pick Georgia after watching <laughs> them play Arkansas last week, Zach? That's I'm true. That's idiot. true. If that's I were an idiot, I'd pick Georgia. But I'm going with Auburn. Um, and you better start praying right now that Bo Nix doesn't throw a sing- Bo Picks doesn't throw a single interception this weekend, Zach, because that will be relentless. I mean, all game. All how are, it, how are you going to be relentless? Says has Miles Brennan even played a single down? Like a, a he hasn't even. Uh, how many series has Miles Brennan played without throwing an interception? I'm not a big I, look. I have oh, wait, oh, wait, wait. I, I know the answer to that. He threw an interception on his last pass of the game, so he hasn't played a single play since throwing an interception. That's fine. Yeah, but he doesn't have a last name like Picks, so um, I'm still going with Auburn, Zach. You can't you can't take that away from me. And now I'm going to win this weekend again. My record is going to continue to be better than yours, even though you threw that BYU game in. I'm going with Auburn 21, Georgia 18 in this game. 21 to 18. That's a lot of field goals for Georgia. You know they lost Rodrigo Blankenship, the GOAT, right? I don't know why I said 18. I'm sticking with 18. That's tough. That's tough. Okay. But, guys, well, you already know what we're going to end the show with. It's going to be a recurring thing here. You got Brandon's Gambling Corner. Let's it's go. a fan favorite with a bit of a twist. Um, you know, it was a staple last year on the last year, last year on, um, on the blue bloods. We we're going to, we're going to bring in a new thing. We did it last week. Instead of Brandon, just listing off his picks, we're going to put him on the hot seat. He doesn't know what I'm about to ask him. He doesn't know what games we're going to have to talk about anything. I'm throwing some gambling questions at him about this upcoming weekend. He's going to tell you where to place your money to bring home some dough this weekend. Brandon, let's kick this. Let's kick this off with my super dog segment. Which SEC underdog game should fans bet their money on this weekend? The team doesn't have to win, Brandon, but the team is going to have to. Yes, it's just a spread. So are you taking South Carolina with 17 and a half points against Florida? Okay, 18 now. My bad. Arkansas, 18 against Mississippi State. Or Vanderbilt, plus 20 against LSU. Uh, Vanderbilt plus 20 against LSU. I hate to say that. I really, really do. But I'm going with Vanderbilt uh, plus 20 against LSU. It's the biggest spread. Um, and and I just I haven't seen enough out of this LSU offense to know that they can score enough points to outscore Vanderbilt by 20. I think I, – look, I hope LSU wins this weekend. If I had to pick uh, if I had to pick a winner, I'd go with LSU for sure. But I, I don't know that they edge them out by, by more than 20 points, especially after seeing Texas A&M just barely edge them out by, like, what, five last weekend? So, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, going, I'm going with I'm, – I'm, that's an easy pick for me. I'm going with Vanderbilt plus 20 against LSU. Last, that was the last one I thought you were going with. Okay, next, Brandon. Should fans have any confidence or even think about putting their money on Virginia this weekend to hold Clemson under the 27 and a half point spread this weekend? No, no, nah, everyone, everyone knows what I think about Virginia this year. Uh, bad is what I think about Virginia. Um, both Virginia teams in the ACC, really. I mean, I, Virginia Tech and Virginia, I just think Virginia is the worst of the two. Um, and no, there's no chance to get within 27 points of Clemson unless, unless Davos <laughs> like, you know what? Let's pull the starters in the second quarter because, and that might happen. I don't know. That, that could happen. If that happens, then Dabo is not a big gambling guy. We know that, but it'd be a lot cooler if he was, but it, it, if, uh, if I had to put my money on it, I, I'd, I'd put, I'd put my money on Clemson minus 27. So b- building off that Clemson game though, Brandon, do you think 
Clemson is going to hit the over on its own. The over is 54 and a half points. <laughs> no, I don't think Clemson scores 54. I don't think they score 55 points in this game, Zach. Absolutely not. You know, the thing I just talked about was Dabo pulling his starters, which if this game is if, – if this is more than a four-touchdown game, like I'm predicting already, starters are gone. Um, I think they're gone well before 55 points. Okay. Hey, fair enough. Fair enough. You never know. What maybe Virginia will talk crap before at like do like what Baker Mayfield where they don't shake Trevor Lawrence's hand and he has to go for ten touchdowns. He might nah, I'm to. rooting for that. I'm rooting for that. But listen, I'm gonna stick with the ACC here, Brandon. It's gonna be another super dog segment. But we're going with the ACC here. Which super dog in the ACC are you going with? NC State at fourteen plus fourteen against Pitt. Duke plus 10 and a half against Virginia Tech or Jacksonville State plus 26 and a half against Florida State. That uh, that one's an easy one for me too, Zach. I have to go with Jacksonville State against Florida State. Uh, 26 and a half points. That's a lot of points. I mean, as long as this isn't a four touchdown game victory for Florida State, who has looked just awful <laughs> every single week they played football for the past two years. Um, then, then I, I, I don't know. I just think Jacksonville State even might even have a chance to win this game. Well, I, I'd oh, be, God. I'd, I'd be curious to know what the money line is. I'm not saying they're going to win. Um, I'm just saying it's going to be a lot closer than 26 and a half points. You know what the money the, line is? Yeah, plus 1600. Oh God, put a little bit on it at least. Uh, put ten dollars, win 160 if they win. I'd do it. I mean, not that I gamble, but I'd do it. <laughs> Good. nice save okay so Brent, on the flip side out of duke plus 10 and a half and nc state plus 14 so nc state plays pitt duke plays virginia tech which pitt or virginia tech which team do you feel have the most confidence of covering their spread oh virginia tech easy um I, and i think they both cover it honestly you know th- this is one of those questions where where you when you asked me you asked me the the those two first, and I was like, oh, this is going to be a really tough one. And then – And that then, Jacksonville State one came up and he said, bet. I said, easy, 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 yeah. So, yeah, I think both of them cover, um, honestly. But I think the easy cover is for Virginia Tech. I mean, I already said I'm not very high on them, but I'm way less high on Duke. I think Duke's awful this year. Um, NC State, not good either, but but you, you never really know. I think Pitt's a really good team as well. Like I said, I think they both cover – uh, I just think that it's a, maybe a little bit easier for Virginia Tech to cover. I'm not. Really, I'm not quite sure why that spreads only at ten and a half. Yeah, that's a that's a tough spread. So now we're going to go with some hypothetical spreads, Brandon. Okay, got some hypothetical bets for you. These, oh. I'm sure you can find someone to take these bets somewhere. So this weekend, Brandon, we have Bo Nix. You already mentioned it heading to Athens this weekend against a stingy Florida, uh, you know, uh, Georgia defense. I'm setting the line. At one interception for Mr. Bo Nix, are you taking the over or under one interception for Bo Nix? Right, okay, so that's tough. So you're going to give me a push. Why don't you set it at half an interception? That way I can't push. Now, how about this? How about this? One and a half. So do I think he throws two interceptions? Yeah. Oh, Four man. Or more. Because I, I told you, the, the UGA mess, uh, uh, 247 board, I've seen six. I've seen four. I've seen five. I heard he got – I saw he got benched. <laughs> they think he's going to get benched. We don't even have a backup quarterback, Brandon. That's that's a bad plan, by I, the way. I think, I think our backup quarterback is like Cam Newton's brother who plays wide receiver technically. Very poor planning on Auburn's part. Um, I, I don't think he throws two interceptions. I, I, I am hoping that he throws at least one, though. I'm really hoping I'm wrong about this too. I'm hoping he throws. I'm hoping he throws the six, and I'm hoping he gets benched because you will never hear the end of that. I'll quit the podcast. Y'all are expecting an episode on Monday. Bet it ain't happening. But if um, it's in this hypothetical spread, I'm going under. I'd have to say I, I don't think he throws two interceptions. Okay, gotcha. So another one. Trevor Lawrence is at 271 consecutive downs played without an interception. The over under is four hundred now, Brandon. Does Trevor Lawrence get over four hundred consecutive downs without interception, or are you going with the under? He throws an interception within the next a hundred and thirty downs or so. Oh man, I need to know Clemson's schedule like ASAP. Do you, Do you know off the top of your head who they play um, next week? Yes, 
they play Miami next week. Oh, under, under, that, under, that, under. That is that is going to be a hell of a game. That's why this that's why this is hard because yes, Miami has a decent defense, but they're they're like I guess the strength of their defense is really not the secondary. Yeah. No, it's not. But but at the same time, he's not. He's human. I, I get it. He might be the best college quarterback we've seen in a very long time. He might ever. be one of the best Correct pro yourself. prospects. Okay. And maybe even ever. And, and so, but that doesn't mean he can't throw an interception. I mean, we saw him last season and we saw him start out really slow last season. I'm not saying that it was slow and bad throughout the entire season, but for the first few games last season, he, it looked a little rough. Uh, I, I, he's human. Like I just said, he's going to throw an interception against Miami next weekend. I call, I'm calling it. Okay, y'all heard it for here first. Apparently, Trevor Lawrence is going to throw an interception next week. Um, so, Brandon, I got one more thing for you. All right, just all right. one. I, I I have to I have to know. Okay, will you bet on your Southern Miss Golden Eagles this week with a one and a half point spread against North Texas this weekend? Are they the favorite? They are the underdog. They are plus oh, one point five. See, Zach, that's the difference because Southern Miss has been the favorite in every game so far this season, um, and I've picked them in both of my in both of my gambling uh, my gambling picks on Saturday mornings. So this one's tough. I was probably going to do that game again. This uh, ow, sorry, I am growing up. Uh, I was probably going to pick that <laughs> game again. I was probably going to pick that game again this weekend. Um, one and a half against North Texas. Uh, <laughs> I'm going with Southern Miss on this one. I'm going with Southern Miss to win that game outright. Oh, like it. The money line is plus 102 there. Um, Brandon, is there any possible way Southern Miss, and, Southern Miss and North Texas combine to hit the over of 72 and a half points? No, 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 no. Who set that line? Why do they do that? <laughs> bet the under. Put the uh, Bet the under like your life depended on it. 72 and a half. That is a mean score for a Southern Miss offense that hasn't been like spectacular this year. No, but they have Frank Gore Jr. People forget. Yeah, but I mean, didn't did you guys lose to Southern Miss? <laughs> Not Southern Miss. Didn't did you guys lose to South Alabama? Yeah, a, a little bit. Yeah. Just a little bit. <laughs> just, <laughs> just a baby loss, I guess. But. Guys, that is a wrap on Brandon's gambling corner. I'm just going to come up with the craziest bets each week for him. Like th- this, this hypothetical segment at the end is going to get wilder and wilder. It's going to be like, is Gus Malzahn going to wear a visor or a sweater vest next week? It's going to get I would, outrageous. I would like to be the first person to say that was a very stupid outfit he wore last week. He's not Pat Dye. Okay, but he was honor. It was the first game that we've played at Jordan Hare since he died. Very good. I I still don't think that he should be playing dress up. <laughs> you know, I actually went the opposite. If he doesn't wear it this week, I'm going to be pissed. Until we lose when he dresses as Pat Dye, <laughs> he can't change. I hope he didn't even take it off this week. I hope he showered full, fully clothed and then just got in the dryer and just dried <laughs> himself like that. Okay. <laughs> that that That's what I'm calling. And Gus, if you're listening, you better dress up as Pat Dow this weekend because we are going into Athens for the victory. But, guys, that is a wrap on this episode. Um, we appreciate all you guys tuning in. Check out our social media. Um, Instagram is at the underscore Blue Bloods. Twitter is at the underscore underscore Blue Bloods. And Facebook is at the Blue Bloods Pod. Check out the website, the Blue Bloods the bluebloodspod.com new article up i'm going to be doing a winners and losers article each week so check that out plot tw- uh, not really a plot twist but shocker lsu is a loser this weekend miles brennan's oh. a loser this week uh, this from this past oh. weekend um and god forbid if lsu loses to vandy brand i hope you know i'm doing two articles and what's this going to be roasting lsu is this going to be the i'm putting lsu with the florida state article i'm going to write next week okay that thanks <laughs> but guys <laughs> great you can find the podcast literally everywhere check us out on youtube the blue blood cfb podcast on there um we got lot um old live streams on there all our old episodes so um you can find us everywhere rate subscribe listen tell your friends if you're going to a game this weekend tell the people six you know six feet away to go listen um whatever you want to do we appreciate all of you guys but for right now we out